thanks for joining this meeting. This is set up to be a Q&A session concerning uh, the CSE President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program, um, which will be run, I guess, I would call it as a joint venture between CSE and the Office of Equity and Diversity, uh, who are gonna be the main co-sponsors of this program. And to start off, David Odie, who has been one of the leaders in uh, developing this concept, I think is gonna present a couple of slides about the program. So, Lindsay, will you allow David to share the screen? Yep, he should have that already. Okay. And, um, thanks, Ellen, and welcome everybody. Uh, so I'm Dave Odie in the BME department, and I'm a part of the CSC uh, Diversity and Inclusion Alliance, and along with Hannah Leopold, uh, the co-chair of the faculty and staff action group. And we're fortunate to have uh, Edgar Ariaga and Kara Santelli on the call too. They're the leads on the overall Diversity and Inclusion Alliance. Uh, that alliance over the last year and a half developed a strategic plan process involving more than 100 members of the CSC community, faculty, staff, students, and culminated in the, the launching of the, um, the uh, strategic plan in October of 2019. And within that strategic plan, uh, we're, each action group would have multiple goals. And one of the goals for the faculty and staff action group was to better connect CSE to this University of Minnesota program, the President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. This has been around for uh, a few years now and it builds from and actually uh, is connected to a longer standing program at the University of California with the intention of increasing diversity of the faculty there. And it's been joined in by us and other institutions like Michigan and Maryland for the same purpose. So the university's had this program for a while now. And uh, there have been a few postdoctoral fellows who have come into the college through this program. And uh, we're fortunate to have Mark Hilmar and Perry Leo who've both had that experience of being the faculty mentor for these postdoctoral fellows and can speak to that experience. And also who um, as part of our um, strategic plan from the Alliance uh, planning, I engaged Mark and Perry to kind of help uh, craft and shape the particulars of, of what this uh, program would entail, how we might do it and doing, and doing it in a way that would um, uh, coordinate with the Office of Equity and Diversity and Keisha Varma has been critical there for the um, involvement of the Institute for Ec Diversity, Equity and Advocacy that she directs within OED. So as Ellen mentioned, this is a joint venture then between OED and CSE and um, a process that um, we can now have as with, and I think you all saw the email and your presence here makes you aware of uh, the announcement that went out last week, launching this program with applications due um, November 1st. So um, I'm gonna try to track the chat box too, and please feel free to interrupt if you got questions or comments. Maybe I'll just um, ask uh, Edgar, who's on here, if he has anything to add, kind of from a high level perspective of the overall goals of the Diversity Inclusion Alliance and the strategic plan for the college. Thank you, David. And I don't want to, to take too much of the time from the Q&A, but one of the aspects that I think is very important as we strive to, to diversify and to be more uh, is to the aspect of inclusion. So the goal will not be to only bring uh, potential future faculty through this program, but also to, to make sure they are welcome from the, from the start. So I think that one of the goals that in the, as we basically assemble this, this this mesh, this network, this context is to, to, to keep in mind uh, from a Versailles view, the importance of uh, inclusivity and mentorship, which is gonna be essential. And uh, so that's, that's gonna be all. Thank you, David. Yeah, that's uh, 
another important point is just the idea that the approach that um, we've articulated with OED is a cohort approach so that this would constitute a program and there would be mentoring and professional development opportunities and funds to help support those development opportunities too. Um, and maybe I'll just pause also to give uh, Mark and Perry a chance to chime in here since they've been engaged in these uh, discussions as well over the last uh, few months here to try to craft this, uh, this program launching. Perry or Mark? Uh, I can start unless Mark wants to. Uh, so I wasn't one of the faculty mentors. I was department head, so worked with the mentors uh, who had the, the fellows. And so I think uh, my role was really to try to include people in the department, make it clear that, you know, that they were people that we were really interested in, in staying in the department long term and helping to build an environment where they were included uh, in departmental activities. And I think that mentoring aspect and, and having your department head and, and department leaders on board is critical because the, you're trying to sell them on your department, the University of Minnesota, at the same time that they're trying to sell you on their potential as a faculty member. I'll stop there. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. I do think that there's different departments do have different cultures with respect to where their uh, folks they hire co come from uh, versus internal and external. And I, and I do think this is a great opportunity to work on diversity in the college if the departments uh, who are interested or, you know, um, willing to broaden their horizons with respect to postdocs, either in maybe sister departments or, or, or uh, closely related departments or even their own department, whereas somebody would come in and then ultimately we could see a path to joining the, the faculty uh, in the college. Uh, I can say in chemistry that's uh, typically uh, not been the case, but there's a precedent and, um, and I think that we should be thinking broadly about this as a, as a bigger opportunity. Yeah, I guess the thinking too, from my perspective is if we continue to do our faculty hiring in exactly the same way that we've always done it, we probably won't see different results than we've had before. And we'll, we've been uh, not very diverse or inclusive in a lot of ways um, in our college to date. And so this is an opportunity to change that and maybe rethink how we do faculty hiring too. Um, okay, um, yeah, I guess I can go through the slides. I think we've kind of already said it. There's only two slides, but maybe just to do the due diligence here, um, I'll share the screen and uh, you can see that. Uh, you've all seen the email, I assume, which was the announcement. And um, yeah, just kind of um, summarize the high points then. Oops. Right. So, you know, partnership with the OED and particularly this Institute for Diversity, Equity and Advocacy and Keisha Marma directs that and has been uh, has committed funds to help make this happen. That will be matched by the college and will need to be also matched by the department and the hosting uh, faculty member. And um, it's not a new program, really. It's but it is in the sense that it's creating a cohort model around an existing University of Minnesota program. Uh, and as I mentioned, Perry and Mark have experience with that. And uh, we're, we're picturing them that the, the, the applicants that we're seeking are gonna be able to be full-fledged faculty members eventually. And so they're, you, they're, they're gonna contribute um, to the research teaching and service eventually, although they're coming in as research fellows. The focus here is on black indigenous people of color applicants. Um, and this is a, a key part from, particularly from OED's point of view uh, in terms of supporting this, but it's a goal that's shared by the, the strategic plan. And then uh, the particulars, uh, recruiting is open now actually. So that's a key thing is we really wanna encourage and exhort faculty to start use your networks of candidates you know that you think would be good candidates for this to just go ahead and contact them. Also your faculty networks that you know, faculty at other institutions uh, that you think may be good contacts to find the right candidates. Um, and then 
uh, those applications are due November 1st and there'll be a review process after that, which is still not entirely um, fleshed out, but will be managed jointly between the OED and the College of Science and Engineering. And you can see uh, where you can apply. That's the university website there. So there's that website. And then also um, the college has created a website too, which I can uh, just share with, with you as well. I put that into the chat. Oh, you did. Okay. So there's a website there. And if you go to that website, the CSE slash PPFP site that Ellen put into the chat, there is also a link there that allows you to download a one page PDF flyer. And we think this could be a useful uh, thing to circulate as you're trying to recruit to kind of explain at a high level what this is about. So we're trying to equip you with the right tools to help do the recruiting too. So we've probably said enough and um, I don't know if any of the, uh, we, we can just open it up for questions at this point. We'll try to answer the best we can. I'm expecting we'll not be able to answer everything and we'll duly note them and, and try to come back with, uh, with a, a better formulation if, if that's what's needed to. So one question, Dave, this is Peter. Um, so in, in math, the tradition has always been the postdocs teach, but you said something about them not teaching initially. So, um, uh, so even postdocs that come on sponsored funds, typically we, we, re we buy out some teaching because we feel it's important that they get teaching experience while they're a postdoc. So that, that seems to be a bit different than what you said about the teaching. Yeah, I'm trying to go back. I'm looking right now, Peter, at the university's webpage to make sure I'm getting the verbiage correct. And if I can't find it, I mean, we'll look into it. I think that's that maybe like Mark was saying, there are differences from one discipline to another. That would not be the expectation in my field, for example, but may very well be in math. So my recollection is that there were some restrictions in the university program on teaching and um, other kind of administrative activities. So we, we would have to check on that. I mean, the university verbiage does say uh, we're interested, the university's program is interested in scholars with the potential to bring their research and teaching uh, the perspective that comes from their educational background or understanding of the experiences of groups historically underrepresented in higher education. I think overall that if teaching is something that the postdoc really wants to do and uh, sees as important to advancing uh, their record, that can probably be organized. It might fit under the professional development part, which is a part of the program. And these, this would, for math, this would make these extremely attractive if you just had the option of teaching and not, not the requirement of teaching. So our, our postdocs, the ones we fund in the department funds, they teach three, three semester courses each year, just the same as the faculty. So that's something like that is fairly standard in, in math departments across the country. I think generally it would seem to me if, if they're being treated like a faculty member, that's a good thing overall um, so that they feel included. But maybe we'll, um, we'll check back in with Keisha who oversees the program for the university to make sure we're resonant and congruent with right. how the university is looking I at. Yes, I think the postdoc, the aim is that the postdoc will receive full support in terms of a salary for 12 months a year and is not required to teach um, but probably can teach i i might say that we should be as flexible as possible especially right. for precedent in the department for the way postdocs are trained and there is a there is actually a faculty contribution a faculty slash department contribution to this so if that i can imagine a scenario where that contribution from the department was 
you know, a potentially for, for, for this teaching experience. I don't think we want to create kind of a, 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 to a bifurcated system where, right. you know, it's not, it would be out of the norm if they didn't teach. So I, uh, you know, my answer to that would be, a, you know, a, a, a strong argument that this is the way, you know, to uh, engage potential future faculty members uh, in the way we uh, have done in the past would be a reasonable argument to make. Um, I just want to add one, one more comment about that. I, I think that in some cases, the university, we have at the on campus, a lot of resources uh, through the uh, basically Center for Educational Innovation uh, in which uh, postdocs that feel that they, will they would like to develop more of the pedagogical aspects of the training that they can, that they can actually uh, benefit from that as well. So flexibility, as Mark is saying, I think is critical. And also that really helps build community as well. How can we actually be effective teachers uh, when, when the time comes to, to become involved in teaching as well? So I think the opportunities are great in that regard as well. I have a counter argument. This is Rhonda. So it's a fellowship, which means that for all the other campuses that are offering similar types of fellowships, you may want to look at how others are structured because since the number of people available are quite small, if they're looking for this type of opportunity, they're going to pick the fellowship that they think offers them the best opportunity to be successful for getting a faculty position. In theory, you're right. Having an opportunity to teach can build this collaborative you know, community but the feedback that I've received from people who have participated in similar types of programs is that there's an unintended consequence. And that is um, unintended and un unintentional, I think, uh, is that they don't get to get as much traction on the research, which is what many of the, oh my God, my dog is going to bark the mailman's here. Okay, wait a minute. I'm going to I'm sorry, he's going to bark. <laughs> um, and, so, and so anyway, the, um, there it goes. So the, um, the thing oh, wow. is, so sorry, this is to the dime when the mailman comes. Um, so what happens is that the, 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 the candidate is now doing this teaching. They don't get as much traction on the research. Um, because they don't get as much traction on the research, it, complicates the perception of faculty of how wonderful these people are because they're teaching that's not that different from being a graduate student or a TA or an adjunct and so it really backfires at the end even though it gives them this great training experience because for our colleagues to say someone that they would want to bring someone on permanently they really don't judge the teaching at the same level that they judge the other things now, if you have someone who's doing quite strong in the research and then they do the teaching, that's different. Um, but they practically have to be quite exceptional to neutralize any consequence of not making significant headway in their research development. So this is shared the link to the frequently asked questions of the applicants. And it says explicitly focus full time on research and avoid other commitments such as teaching or additional employment. Yeah, I just spotted that on the faculty mentor fac also, and I put the link for that in there too. Um, we can, you know, we could take it up with Keisha and see if, if the argument could be made that it's professional development and it would be limited in some way um, and still allow a robust research component where that line gets drawn. For the university, I, maybe it's a hard line. There's absolutely no teaching allowed. I'll, we'll find out from Keisha. Can I just kind of comment on something that Rhonda said that maybe she didn't say explicitly too, but my feeling is, is that the pool of candidates for PPFP is going to be very small and it's going to be competitive to get outstanding candidates in. And we, I think that we will have a better chance if candidates knew that they were going to be focusing on research. I don't know if Rhonda, you didn't exactly say that, but don't you think that that would help us do a better job getting people here? I think so, because the thing that is, when I look at my colleagues who have started off exceptionally strong as faculty members, 
they were able to just wear one hat. And so wearing that one, wearing that one hat, focusing yourself and trying to really take advantage of that this is the only time between your graduate studies and your faculty position that you get to wear one hat, it, it can make a huge difference. And what tends to happen is for people who um, get, get um, more diluted, you know, they're getting a more broadband experience, which in theory is right, but, but they're already getting a broadband experience, right? They're already gonna be asked to participate in things and all of these other kinds of things. I feel like if it's something where you said the option is available, if there's interest, that's one thing. But I really feel like when you look at the people who have completed postdocs successfully, what I've been amazed at, amazed about is how they were able to take that time to really identify what they had to develop their skill set and, and really do it and just focus on that and, and take that as a as a leveraging point. Um, these Rhonda, other I, things I think, start getting, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead, Rhonda, I'm sorry. I was just going to say these other things get offered as options because they really are good ideas. But in reality, we know that part of the challenge with trying to get a person from this particular group is that oftentimes our colleagues don't think they're strong enough to begin with. And then if you, if you put in there that this is good for you and you do all of this, but then the one thing that we know we're judged on isn't enhanced substantially. I don't know that we really do people a favor later. That's all. And I think like if, if I were advising someone, I'd say go to the place where you can focus on one thing. And they're going to look at it. They're going to look at how much it costs. They're going to look at the experiences they can get there. And they're going to say, well, Michigan is offering me this, but this place is requiring me to do that. And if they have both opportunities, I think they're going to go to the one. I like, I hear what you're saying. I think it's the idea that um, being flexible uh, is an important one, I think, in all of this. So there could be candidates, maybe particularly in math. This is not a thing in chemistry mm -hmm. and probably not in mechanical engineering right. uh, or chemical engineering and material science, really. I mean, if you get to teach a lecture right. or two, that's fine. But if, it is, if it's a thing in math, then being flexible, I think, is important. But it has to come from the right. candidate. I completely agree with that. It can't be, yeah, you can, I, I don't think, Peter, it can be, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to teach because we need teaching or we think it's good for you. I think it has to be, because it's a fellowship, has to be driven by the candidate. So I would advocate for flexibility in that regard. Um, uh, with respect to what the candidate was mainly interested in. But I don't, CMS, I don't think, and mechanical, and, and maybe, David, you said it wasn't in biomedical and in chemistry. It's not. You're right, Rhonda. I think the folks who come as postdocs really just do want to focus on that, that research. Yeah, I, I, was not, I was not saying this was going to be a requirement. I said if it's an option, it makes it a very attractive position. Um, I know when we in the old days, we, we followed what everybody has been saying, was research and nothing else. Nowadays, we, we pay a lot of attention to t people's teaching ability. We need teaching to, to seriously consider most people for a tenure track position. We need some teaching credentials. It's almost impossible now in our department to hire somebody who has had no teaching experience. And I think that would be a good thing to emphasize if the candidate you get didn't do a TA during their graduate school experience. I mean, if it's clear when you no. look at their portfolio that right. that's a missing link, you yeah. won't, I think most rational people would say, oh, oh yeah, I've never done a TA. I should probably do something to make myself look good that way. Um, I, I just, you know, I, it's just, a, it's, it's a mixed bag, but you also have to go with the culture of the community. If that's what the math culture is, then a person stepping into that community has to, you know, kind of go with what the culture is. I, I, as a graduate student, what I remember about the definition of fellowships is that it could not require uh, any type of specific work because of the, you know, the use of the word fellowship. Uh, and so I don't know if that extends to the use of the word fellowship for postdocs or not, but there was, you, you, we were not allowed to work uh, when we had fellowships as a requirement from the, from the fellowship because the fellowship was not to pay for, it was not intended to pay for specific outcomes. Um, so that may be something else you wanna pay attention to, I'm not sure. Can, can I ask a question about, um, I read 
that it's whether women are included in this PPFP uh, solicitation. I mean, it does say that there's this broad group that are considered in PPFP, but we're targeting or specifically looking for people of color. Um, should we, but who is allowed to apply or eligible? Um, well, I'll comment on that. Uh, of course, women are eligible. However, with regard to this specific program, uh, as is written, uh, it's focused on candidates from the BIPOC community. And that relates to our support also from OED. So let's say, okay, this is just so random, but I had a person, con somebody contacted us who's from Iran. Do they count? How do you know if somebody counts as BIPOC or not? I mean, I, I just felt like, how am I qualified to know this? You know, do you, do you encourage or discourage people? Do you sort of, you know, a woman contact you and say, well, so sorry, but this program, I don't think we're going to be taking any women or how, what do we do here? That's a good question. I think it's a question for all of us all the time. Um, we could discuss it with Keisha. So she would See be okay she has if I to say, sorry that she couldn't make this meeting. But I could just email her and say, so, cause we don't, you know, we have lots of people contact and say, I'm looking for a mentor, you know, and that's, and, and we, you know, we're trying to decide within our faculty whether we should kind of pool and see who's all looking for mentors and then we only move a few forward so that we're not, you know, um, right. Right. So I, I just, it will be important in the evaluation that there's really a clear plan of mentorship uh, for a given candidate. So, I know in our previous discussions about this, this isn't a free postdoc for some faculty member. Uh, this is really about bringing someone in who we think is talented, uh, but not just bringing the person in, looking at how to ensure the success of that person. So that will definitely be part of the evaluation. And yeah, and then, so your specific question, how do we define people of color? Um, I don't have a simple answer for that, uh, but we'll ask. I just wanted to add uh, a little bit to that as well. And, and I think that that's, that's something that is so personal as well, that, that I think that if, if we start trying to tease that, that one apart, uh, it really has to be the candidate that, that reads that and say, hey, I consider myself uh, a brown person or a black person, a person of color. And because I, I I, if I if you show me a bunch of applications and I try to understand what's I, I wouldn't know what to say. So it really has to be from the person, I think. Is there anything in the application materials like I you know that they have to fill in that even gives you an indication or? I mean I didn't see that the, we put one through last year and I don't re recall anything. It's a good question as well. And we'll ask, I think. I would, uh, I would guess almost certainly not required. There's a component um, education and background statement, 500 to 700 words describing your personal background and contributions to diversity and equal opportunity throughout through your academic career would seem to be the component closest to that.
I put the link in the chat. But we can still ask from, because this program, as Ellen pointed out, uh, it is more specific than that requirement for the application for this program. What does that mean? And that's that was a very that was a high priority for OED as it is for us. Um, but if it doesn't meet their definition or perspective, doesn't isn't congruent with that perspective, then they're not going to be enthused about supporting that candidate as much for this program. That's my understanding. But we'll we can again ask Keisha how right. she's going to deal with how she'll manage that. And you asked also where this is in the application. Well, there needs to be a letter explaining the mentorship. And maybe part of that will become, how are you going to mentor this person within our community uh, as a person of color? So said person is not isolated or uh, is provided uh, the right resources and network opportunities. Um, I, that, I, sorry. I was just going to add, uh, if you could probably see on the university website for the program, the, the, those letters from uh, mentors and department chairs or heads are due December 1st. So there's a one month additional window to submit that material. Sorry, Teresa. Yeah, um, I, thanks, David. Um, I was just going to ask a quick question about, again, eligibility and if, um, you know, are these all, is this only open to brand new candidates not at the University of Minnesota, or is it potentially open to existing very strong postdoctoral candidates at the University of Minnesota that, you know, maybe are on the faculty market this fall? Well, I know that this question arose about two minutes before we started this afternoon. Um, and one response is, if that person is considering going on the job market this fall, why aren't we considering hiring them right away at the faculty level? Um, that would be my first response. If separately it's felt that the person's postdoc experience was short or incomplete in some way, and said person needs to continue on a postdoc, uh, maybe that could be argued. Um, or, yeah. or is going to broaden the research area or pursue a new line that, uh, you know, may be fruitful right on the road so ellen this i have a specific case in my group for example i have a current postdoc who actually applied for this program the very first year it came out and um she was actually selected but when i when moss called me you know he said we don't have money but you know if you support her or whatever and at that time you know i was planning to hire her in and put her on a like a sponsored project. And I felt like it was maybe a conflict of interest to say she had this fellowship, but yet I'm sponsoring her on this grant. And so I didn't, you know, nobody could answer questions. So in the end, I actually, I didn't accept it because there wasn't even, um, there were you know, no specific fun. program. Yeah, fun. there wasn't any funds and there wasn't a program. So now that this is coming up again, um, you know, I do feel like she could be a strong candidate. And for example, our college right now is in a hiring freeze. However, this could be a way for our college to hire. So this is where I'm kind of unclear. You know, I do think she would be open to extending her postdoc. I think just right now she's going on the market because she's nervous. She thinks, you know, what if 
next year is worse than this year. And so that's why she's going on the market this year. Um, so, you know, again, I'm just, there's a lot of, I think that could be things that could be clarified maybe. Um, and, you know, certainly I don't want her to apply if this is not, um, you know, you know, an opportunity, right. an existing opportunity. Um, can I well, add something? Go ahead. So one of the things that we talked about was department cultures. And one of the concerns is if you're hiring somebody that's in your department, that a postdoc in your department, and then you're thinking about hiring him or her for a faculty position in your department, that should be consistent with the department culture. Otherwise, it really puts that person in a bad position. You're hiring one person and only one person that's been a grad student in your department say, you know, it might be the right thing to do. They may be the best person for the job, but there also might be people in your faculty that are upset that your student got hired and not their student or something like that. So I think that's, that's just an issue that has to be navigated along with these other issues. So, I think what Perry said uh, brings up the point that anyone that applies for this program successfully will need support from the given department or it could be maybe a split among multiple departments um, and an explanation of that support. So for any specific case, I think that's an important consideration. Um, separately, I just wanted to comment on, well, uh, we have a hiring freeze. Uh, we may have exceptions. We are allowed to hire in exceptional cases. Personally, I can't predict the future on this um, because I don't know what it is. Uh, but in various examples, departments can make the case for exceptional hires that can be approved by the provost. So that's what I have to say about hiring in general. It all may change next week, but um, this is what I'm observing right now. Uh, this is at the faculty level. If it's at the postdoc level, if the postdoc is on sponsored funds, then those hires are allowed. Um, just to clarify. Uh, in terms of the specific case that you've asked about, um, I can't give you a quick evaluation, but I would consider uh, the specific circumstances and does the person appear to fit in terms of having uh, the right needs to be sponsored by this program going forward in terms of development. So I guess um, leading up to that, would you suggest then people who are potentially putting candidates forward for this, you know, contact departments that could potentially be interested. So it was sort of a pre-planning, um, you know, for example, this person could fit in chemistry, chemical engineering, or biomedical engineering. Right. Yeah, and um, as David said, I think the deadline for mentoring letters is December 1st. So there is a, significant amount of time after a person applies. And uh, so, yeah, I think that would be a very good idea to follow uh, to build a case. And Can I, uh, I could say something, Ellen. Last year, we actually made a hire, we made an offer to a PPFP and a faculty hire at the same, like to one person, and we tried to hire for a faculty position. So she, she eventually turned us down to do a postdoc at Sandia, but it was a, a like a multi-year offer with the PPFP being for two years. And then we, 
we uh, said that we were done with the search and the way we did it was we had a search. She happened to have applied to both the search and the PPFP. We brought in a number of candidates who had not, did not have postdocs. So the faculty felt comfortable judging her as a potential faculty member. So we felt comfortable that we could make a faculty offer even though it was so far off in the distance because of the, because we had a search going. Unfortunately, she turned us down because the postdoc at Sandia was amazing. It was, you know, was just so much better than what we could offer. So I see there's a question from David Blank. Would you characterize participation as having some level of hiring approval? Uh, I can't say yes. <laughs> and I was just curious because it, it, it's, it's, it's part of what you were wrestling with, I think, before in this question. Of, right. If you had somebody of interest, why wouldn't you just hire them now? And is, is this a different avenue to hiring or should we consider this under the exact same hiring freeze and approval process we have for any hire at the moment? Okay, I think you just asked about three questions. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> That's normal. We're all used to it, Ellen. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so, I think... If there's someone right now that you think looks like a great potential candidate, then you could discuss it with Moss. Okay. Um, uh, is the barrier the same as the barrier to hiring the same as for everyone else? Um, uh, Sorry. I'm sorry. I meant Barry in the sense of the, the current hiring freeze and approval process. So just, right. Is there any difference to that process for those who participate in the process? Well, so you might be able to make a stronger argument. I mean, okay. same process, but maybe it adds what to we're dealing with so. is uh, any, any hire or attempt to hire right now has to have approval from the provost. And so Moss has to make the case. That's how it is at the moment. Ellen, can I said I can't predict going forward. Ellen, can I make a comment on that? I, I feel like we said this in earlier committee meetings is that instead of looking at our own groups, we should, as David said, using our network and trying to figure out how can we bring highly qualified candidates to apply to this program? I realize it takes work recommendation letters, mentors, and all that stuff. And if we have a pool of candidates that would be outstanding PPFP folks, I think during the selection process, which will be involved many people, I'm sure, uh, there may be time to then say, this person is so outstanding, let's talk about a potential faculty offer along with a postdoc offer right. and try to make it work. You know, I think the idea of maybe going to your own group and saying, oh, well, this person would be great. And I could say that, that, that's certainly part of it. I don't think that should be excluded. I do think collectively as a college, we should be looking in our, our wider networks to do that. I've, all, I've said from the beginning, getting a, a great pool of candidates in is the right starting point. And what will happen, I hope, is that you know, there's only three positions. Let's hope. I, Sue, I don't know how many we're going to get. I'm hoping we get a lot. And if it comes down to, wow, these are three outstanding candidates. In fact, they could be faculty members. Let's have discussions with the dean and the department heads and the provost to see if you can't make it happen. I realize that it takes work to put in an application, but it's work that I think we should do. And, you know, I can imagine pitching this to a potential postdoc candidate saying, yeah, this is a great fellowship program. And I think, you know, it could be leading to a faculty position. I can't offer that to you today. I don't have the authority, but I do feel like it's something that, uh, that it would be positively, you know, we would look at that positively. That's kind of my approach instead of saying, oh, well, I'm not going to do it because it's not hardwired to a faculty position. I, I'd be more in, you know, enthusiastic about the possibility and try to get a big cohort of applicants. So I agree with what Mark just said. And part of why we're having this meeting right now is we really want to encourage people to get the word out and it doesn't have to be someone that's in your own research area, but rather we're looking for people that are talented. So I, 
Uh, see that R Rhonda has made the comment about next prof having an excellent pool. Um, we can try to propagate this program to next prof, but I can tell you, Rhonda, starting last year, I had trouble where uh, next prof won't give us the names. I can try to send this off to someone who can try to distribute to that pool, uh, but I wasn't able to obtain names of participants anymore. In the past, that was possible. Yeah, so I, what I was just gonna say is, if the college wants to be more proactive in this space, the best thing to do is to make to show interest in participating in the program. Um, they had asked me to do it this year, but I didn't have enough notice to participate. So it, I didn't do it, but it was the first week of classes this year. Um, and they asked me at a really short notice. But the, and, and the thing is, you, you, all of these programs become sensitive about, you know, is this a scavenger hunt for, you know, everybody else? So that's not really why you want to do it. Right. The people that I know who applied here, who participated in Next Prop, it took two and three years for them to actually show up in the roster. But it was all based on one conversation that I had with them at the time. Uh, I would do the panels on, um, getting tenure. So I would, that, that's how I was participating. Plus uh, it was started at Michigan. So I was involved there, but I think it's more about understanding the culture that you're trying to encourage to come. It, it, there's gotta be a mechanism in, there's gotta be a process in place to create a relationship because these are highly, at least for, for African-American and Latin communities, this is very relational groups. So some of it is you're looking for good candidates, but the other piece is you have to figure out, look, I'm going to go and do this thing so I can get to know people. And it's through that experience that is what moves you up in the ranking on people's um, radar. And, I, and I, I've said that to many people about how I got here. Uh, my colleague, it took him three years to get me to apply here. Uh, but when I did decide to apply here, it was because he had shown enough commitment in me, uh, commitment in my career, right? that I felt like when he was still asking and I was at a point where I thought it would be worthy of consideration, he was the one person that I would know when I came here. I knew no one else in the state of Minnesota except this one person through a professional conference. And that's gonna be true for many of the candidates that you're going to connect with that are from the US in that BIPOC co community. When you go outside the US, it's a different story. Um, because it's, you know, there are different networks in place. But when you, when you put that in perspective, what it really means is that we all have to sort of make a commitment to figure out where, where are these groups communicating in our own technical meetings and start taking the time to go and get people to know you and you to know them. And then you have a pool to talk to about these new opportunities when they pop up. You only you need to say it to one or two people and then it sort of propagates. The other thing I've noticed is on LinkedIn, more recently, um, a number of faculty are announcing their students. Sometimes they'll take a photo with a student. Uh, sometimes people are actually posting what they do their research in. There are a lot of other things on LinkedIn that I would probably delete if it were left up to me. But that's another place that I'm finding that if you start exploring, you know, linking up with somebody that represents the group you're interested in and connects you to their network. And then if you have a relationship with that one person, then you can now say, we're looking for people in this area. Um, do you know anybody that's working in this area? And people can then think about their own network. So I have a client, I have a friend whose who's friend is working on that topic. You know, I, we can, I can talk to them, but this is very talk to people kind of work. This is not post an ad and then, you know, if you build it, they will come. Most likely they won't see it to, to know, or even if they see it, they may not think it applies to them. Thanks. I'll, I'll reiterate, I think this is where we will be 
we will be well served to try to go to whatever networks we have now uh, to try to, because I agree with Ron, it's, you know, it's got to be work, you know, and I'm, you know, queuing up emails to colleagues I know outside the University of Minnesota, who I consider high profile folks who have um, uh, great, great potential candidates uh, historically um, that could, that could uh, be appropriate for this uh, program. So I, I think it's worth looking outside for folks that come in more than looking inside. Thanks. So I see uh, there are two related questions. How will candidates be evaluated and we'll be doing the evaluating. And one thing I'll say is because this is a joint program, uh, candidates will be evaluated both through uh, the overall program run through OED and Keisha Verma is the key contact there uh, and CSE. And I think from CSE, we'll probably have a panel of uh, faculty members uh, working on those evaluations. Uh, how will the candidates be evaluated? Well, hopefully, hopefully we get a lot of strong candidates and I think they're gonna be evaluated uh, across multiple questions related to um, potential for strong research um, and potential for good mentoring here, uh, strong mentoring. Uh, those are gonna be, I think, the two most important factors. And potential to be a successful faculty member in the future. Uh, but it won't just be about the candidate, it'll also be about the mentoring. Thank you, Ellen. It looks like you're, oh. oh, go ahead, Rhonda. Here, I was going to say, and, and, and to really um, uh, ditto your comment about mentoring, Ellen, is step one is you identify someone, you reach out to them. They don't apply the first year but you continue to show interest. That is mentoring. Because at that point, if you're right. showing, not asking me to apply to your program, but talking to me about what I'm doing, helping to make connections with people that are on your campus that might be useful to work with, those are the things that will help people say, you know, um, that's why I decided to go here because I knew that there was a support system here for me. And this person owes me nothing, and yet they're trying to help me better my career. I have a friend who uh, was at another university who used to come, some of you in chemical engineering may know her, Christine Grant. She used to come here when she, when I, when she was an associate professor because of, I can't think of his name now, he has a his brother, uh, Mac, Mac, Mac or something. Terrell had invited her into his lab, and so she would come and she worked with him, and and I came here also because I knew Christine and she sang praises about what, uh, what her experience was with Terrell. And I thought, okay, I have my colleague who I don't know so much, but he sure seems interested in my work. I have someone I know a little bit better who's having a good experience. It's the collection of small data points that give you the confidence to say, I, I'm willing to go try that because I feel like you know, my best interest is at heart here. So you, we really need to create lots of crumbs around trying to get this one candidate, but, but knowing that a lot of little things can add up to what you want as an outcome as well. And that was very important, at least for me, because I never intended to come to Minnesota, ever. And I've been here 21 years. So uh, clearly it's been a good experience, otherwise I would have been gone. Thanks a lot. Rhonda. There was. Uh, and I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There was one other question in the chat that kind of got buried a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, 
How will you know that the program was successful? Example, if we hire all non-US women that fit the POC, is that what motivated the creation of this program? Well, I think the answer is that wasn't what motivated the creation of this program. And so we will have to think about people with, I would say, US roots. Uh, I don't want to start out being exclusive, uh, but that is a big motivator for this program and therefore I think that'll be a consideration. Have you thought about how you will leverage the efforts that are done this year? Like that's one of the things I noticed when I was, you know, when I would come back and talk about next prop with the college, I always felt like it was a one, it was one, one and done. And so then the next year was one and done and the next year was one and done. And I'm just wondering if, if as you pursue this particular endeavor, if some thought has been given to how you're going to create a, a perpetual database that gives you, the, that allows little efforts to be cumulatively helpful over time. Uh, I know a number of people who are now in academia that are African-American, they came out of the national labs. So let's say you get someone who goes into the national labs and you know, after about five years, they're really looking for a career change, but because it's one and done, you lose that, you lose the name, number one. You can always look them up on LinkedIn if you know the name but we could then revisit that person later for, for faculty positions. And that means the effort of, the, the small effort of everybody still benefits the whole system. Um, I think the way, I, I never got the impression that what I was sending was retained in some way. And I think the, the college lost the benefit of being able to track people who maybe weren't attracted in this round, but that the different departments could come back and say, let's look at the next prof candidates from three years ago, maybe they're working in an area that's of interest to us. We can, you know, it's not that many people, right? When you look at the distribution. So, you know, what is it to look up three names and see where they are now and what they're doing? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And I also hope with this program and the idea that we can get a good number of applicants, well, we have a limit on how many people we can fund directly through this program. Um, but these names will come up and they will be associated with different areas and it will provide a means to connect and hopefully uh, allow people to think about additional ways and um, eventually attracting people. So the fact that uh, if people will really buy in and seek out candidates, just identifying candidates is really useful or potential candidates where it might turn out, well, I don't want to apply this year, but hopefully people will remember uh, in future years. So I think that is another really good point. Ellen, may, may I add yes. one more comment? Um, and that's, uh, I'm just reflecting on, on when I was looking for faculty jobs as well, and how important it was to try to identify if there was going to be some critical mass of people that looked like me among my colleagues. Uh, clearly, that wasn't the case in Minnesota, but still, it was, it was, uh, I was very attracted for many of the reasons as well. So, but something that is important, particularly if the goal is to attract these, uh, these candidates, might be not only to, uh, and this is a, 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 a shout, a shout out to the Alliance here and other DEI efforts on campus. Maybe anyone who is trying to find a candidate or is trying to encourage a candidate to apply, say, hey, we have some efforts. You might want to reach out to the Diversity and Inclusivity Alliance 
or these other different different office, uh, offices or communities on campus so that we can actually participate indirectly on the recruitment of these candidates even though they are not necessarily part of the formal mentoring plan that is basically uh, the, the faculty and the departments are trying to right. establish. So important to have that community uh, for on the side besides the formal process as well. Yeah, I completely agree and I think that's a great idea. I think, uh, as you heard, I guess, for example, from Sue earlier, um, people that apply, they're probably gonna have more than one offer. Uh, or they may be having lots of different considerations. And so it's going to become important to really work to attract them, uh, whether it's through this program or some, some other one. And yeah, I think the CSE DNI Alliance is a great resource and hopefully um, an attractor uh for postdocs and potential faculty okay um any additional comments or questions thanks everyone for all the questions that it's really helpful because this is new and there are things we need to work out. <laughs>